Welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop. We're your host, Brian Hart. Adam El Perhuni. I have been working in the financial industry for over 18 years. I started in New York City and in 2010, expanded my business to Alexandria, Virginia. For over 25 years, I have been gaming and investing in collectibles. I grew up in Georgia and in 2017, moved to Washington, D.C. Investor's Coffee Shop is for people who want to learn more about investing, make better decisions, create new streams of income. In each episode, we will discuss investing in art, wine, collectibles, stocks, bonds, real estate, and anything else that may generate a profit. Join us at Investor's Coffee Shop. Welcome back to Investor's Coffee Shop. We are starting off the new year with some new and exciting changes. Last year, I was lucky enough to have Juanita help co-host the first five episodes. She helped me create this podcast and will continue to help out with marketing and managing the website. I would like to thank her for all of the hard work and having traveled from New Jersey to Virginia so we could record each episode. Without her help, I do not think Investor's Coffee Shop would have made it this far. I would like to introduce Investor's Coffee Shop new co-host, Adam El Tahoni. You might remember him as a guest on popular episode, Investing in Magic the Gathering. Let's give listeners some background information about you. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in the Atlanta, Georgia area, about an hour west, and just kind of moved closer to the city as I got older. Why did you move to the D.C. area? So I moved to D.C. I met my wife in Atlanta, and then she got a job up in Washington, D.C., so we moved up there and loving it ever since. And what were some of the first things that you collected that ended up turning into investments? So the first things I collected that ended up turning into investments were comic books, and then I moved into Magic the Gathering cards. Did a little bit of baseball cards beforehand, but really Magic the Gathering is when I kind of got into my groove and got into a way of making a sound investment and good money off of it. I think we all started with comic books and baseball cards. So out of those things, do you still have any of those mementos, and which one's your most valuable? So I still have all the comic books because I just uh, am a hoarder a little bit too. So I just can't get rid of them yet. Still have a few baseball cards, but I got rid of most of those because there were baseball cards from the 90s and the early 90s was just kind of a over printing of baseball cards and most of them are worthless. And then Magic the Gathering, I still invest in, collect in and uh, use that primarily. What made you decide to join us on Investor's Coffee Shop and become the co-host? We did the Magic the Gathering episode and we had a great time and just a kind of a great back and forth. And I've done a lot of little audio projects in the past. Really just you kind of reached out to me, thought, seeing if I was interested. And I decided that it was a good chance to get involved and actually learn about all this other investing. I know we're going to cover a lot of other topics during this podcast. Everything seems interesting, something I don't know about and I'd love to learn more about. You currently are also on another podcast. What is the podcast about? I am a participant in the Stephen Knight Show, and the Stephen Knight Show is a general topics entertainment podcast. The host interviews various, uh, usually musicians or actors. I participate in doing the movie and film and entertainment section, so I'll review movies, review TV shows every week. What do you hope to learn from Investor's Coffee Shop? What are some of the exciting categories you hope we get to do in the future? I'm hoping to learn where to put my money that I've been putting in bad places or just sitting in the bank into something that actually gives me a better return on investment than just sitting uh, you know, in a checking a savings account. A lot of topics that seem interesting are the wine, various kind of non, I guess, tangible assets. The trust episode is going to be great because that's something I can't physically see, but I know has a lot of benefits. On this episode, we're going to talk about trust accounts, why they are so important, and the different types of trust accounts that are available. I would like to introduce our guest, Chris Hanks. He has a private practice located here in Alexandria, Virginia. His expertise are in estate planning, trust creation and administration, estate litigation, and elder abuse litigation, just to name a few. He currently practices law in Virginia, Washington, D.C., and California. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Chris, welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop. What's the reason you chose estate planning and trust creation? Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of the show. So I am. I decided to get into elder, the, the broad category of elder law, mostly because I had friends whose parents passed and watched them be unable to make their own decisions of where everything went. When if you don't make a decision on what happens to your goods, the government will make one for you. It's called intestancy. It's a very slow process. It never turns out the way you want it to. I got into uh, estate planning and elder law to help people in those situations. Is there a story you could tell us where you helped somebody who seemed like they had no hope at all in the situation? I do. I have have a client uh, that I really enjoyed working with. Uh, They were longtime partners and the decedent 
Uh, the partner that passed away had executed a will, leaving everything to his longtime partner. They were together 30, 40 years. The problem was that the will was a photocopy. At least in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you need to submit an original copy of the will, but we couldn't find it anymore. Who knows? It got thrown out. Uh, you know, it was executed 20 years ago. So what you do in this case is go to the court, you know, provide the photocopy, ask the court to submit it as the original. You have to back it up of what proof you have that this was the final one, because what the court does, if they can't find the original of, of, a, of a will, they presume that the person destroyed it intentionally as a way of revoking it. Through that whole process, always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Made sure that this person's longtime partner received his, his will rather than family that he never, ever talked to. Well, let's get to our uh, kind of the main meat of this. Trusts. Why, what are they? Why do we need it? Give us kind of the, your, your full view and rundown of it. Trusts, the easiest way to think of trusts are they are separate legal entities, much like a business or corporation that you start. It is this, its own separate entity that you transfer funds to, and, and it has two distinct advantages, especially in the estate planning field. One is that as goods that are transferred over to a trust avoid probate. In Virginia, uh, at least, the saying is, the saying among attorneys is that things in a revocable trust, the transfership drops like a stone. It happens immediately. There's no probate process. The second is that the funds that you put in there as the settler, which is the person who funds the trust, you put in your home, you put in your life insurance, et cetera, controls what happens after they die. You can say within a trust to my children until to pay for their college expenses until they turn 25 and then they get half the money. And then when they're 30, they get the other half. Uh, up until then, it's managed by whoever. Their grandparents, my financial advisor, a trust company. There's a lot of trust you know, companies who do this and it's managed and invested this is how you control what happens. You know, I have seen it happen before where a child is 19 years old and sadly their parents dies and suddenly this 19-year-old is given a half million dollars in real estate and uh, life insurance and blows through it in a year. That's not every 19-year-old, but that's a lot of them. That would have been me when I was 19 years old. So the trust allows you to make these decisions now, transfer things in so that when the worst does happen, the family's not in probate court for six months or a year trying to sort everything out. And makes things much easier on you and then gives you much more control over what happens when you pass. You mentioned the probate process. How can I avoid it? What is this? Because I don't know what the term means. Probate overall is the court's way of making sure that when you pass, your will is executed, your estate is wrapped up, your debts are paid, your final taxes are filed. Uh, just that everything is wrapped up like dissolving a business. Same kind of thing. And that's the probate is the court administration of that. So they are the people who, if there's a will, they look at the will. If it passes muster, they appoint the executor, they get a surety bond. The executor has to file an inventory, has to do accountings, has to account for every nickel that's spent, where it went to, that the people that are supposed to get X amount of money, $50,000, 20% of the trust, however, 20% of the will, that's done that the copy that the court has a copy of the check that the court has a notarized statement from the person saying I received this money so they know that they got it at wrapping it up making sure that if there were expense uh, you know estate expenses which there always are that they are actual estate expenses if i made a 20 dollar purchase on amazon they want to see the receipt that it's for a lockbox for the house and not for a pokemon card for my kid if you owe money to college like so many of us do in america can they come after your trust account when you pass away if you still owe money? It depends on the trust. If it is a, what is known, the most standard one is called a revocable trust. That's a trust you set up and in the document, in the trust creation document, you say this trust is set up by me for my benefit and I can make any changes at any time I want. Legally, for creditor protection purposes, for tax purposes, it's you own it. It's just, there's just sort of a legal minor step. Uh, that's why I tell so many people, especially young couples, to put their home in in the revocable trust because you get the benefits of, the, of avoiding probate and making things easier upon administration. But in terms of your mortgage, in terms of your property insurance, in terms of your county property taxes, nothing changes. You own it. You don't need to do any extra steps. You have a federal right to put your the home that you own, you know, your homestead into a revocable trust. Nobody can stop you. Uh, things get a little muddier if it's a vacation home, although most places don't have a most you know, mortgage holders don't have a problem with that. Now, if it's a revocable trust, like I said, it's yours, then yes, it can be used to pay your estate expenses. Whether they can come after it is a little bit of a question mark. Most jurisdictions they can, but I don't want to say 100%. There are other type of trusts like Medicaid Asset Protection Trusts, a qualified, in Virginia, it's a qualified self-settled spendthrift trust, which if you meet a certain set of benchmarks after five years, 
the money cannot be gone after after creditors. It is, it is a trust that is for your benefit, that is managed by somebody else that a creditor cannot touch. I want to take it a step back for a second. Yes. The probate process, you mentioned wills. A will would still go through a probate process? Absolutely. Wills go through probate prompt. Go through the probate process. The only way to truly avoid probate is to have a trust. And then you mentioned two types, the irrevocable and revocable. One seems better than the others, and I think I understand what you mean by the difference of them. What is more popular? Revocable, 100%. Because irrevocable, a real downside of an irrevocable trust, especially if it's, you're trying to make it a qualified spendthrift trust, is you put money into there, you put assets into there, you put a home into there. You then have no legal right to change the trust. You can't withdraw it. Even if you manage it, if for some reason uh, you want to change it, you're limited in what you can do. If it's a spendthrift trust, part of the qualification process for that is your trustee, the person managing that trust, can't be connected to you by blood, can't work for you, has to be independent. That's what makes it that qualified. That's why they have that qualified language. If you do that, it's great creditors can't get over it, but if you want to sell the house and the trustee says no, you have no legal right to, tr- to sell that house. So it's, it's possible. So uh, understanding these types of trust before we get even deeper into it is that with that type of trust, you could set up that trust. You could go broke. You don't get anything from that trust. So that trust lives on as a separate entity. And as you, as the grantor, I suppose you, you, don't, you can't do anything about it. Well, you can't do anything about it. You can't, you don't have a legal right to change anything in it. Now, when you're drafting the trust, because you have full control over that, you can say, this trust is for my benefit. These funds are only supposed to be used for my benefit to keep me comfortable, to keep me in fine wines. Uh, you literally can, can say anything you want. And then the trustee of that, even if they're independent from you, still has to abide by that order in there. So it's not completely, but if, you know, changing circumstances, who knows where we're all going to be in 10 years. If you want to make a major change to that and dissolve the whole thing, you don't have any legal right to do so. So you gave us kind of the two main types of trust. I know there's a lot of other categories. Can you give us kind of a brief overview of maybe the most popular? You know, I know if I heard of children's trust, of course, trust own kids, things like that. What are the kind of top popular ones? The top popular one would be for, I've, I work with families who have a special needs child. The special needs child, the, the parents know that one day they'll be gone. The child will be in their 20s or 30s and will still need assistance, will still need help getting around and qualifies for a number of government programs. Almost all of those government programs are going to be income-based, based on the theory that this person is unable to take care of themselves enough to make, a, make an income. You know, they need helpers to help them get to work. They need transportation services. They need housing services. And if this person, if there's nothing in place, this person could get a life insurance payout of $200,000, will not be able to do it, will get kicked off all these government services. So it's called a special needs trust, which is a type of irrevocable trust where you say... Much like the irrevocable trust we were talking about earlier, you say this money is for this person. They have no legal right to change it. So they can't say, hey, I want this money now. They can't say, I want you to invest in this or X or Y. And within the trust itself, you say this person making a distribution is going to kick this person off government benefits and don't do it. It's also called a supplemental needs trust. If this person is, let's say, living in government assisted housing, you can then, the trust can then pay for their groceries. The trust can pay for them to go to the movies. The trust can pay for them to... Do anything else that is not covered by the government to make sure that they have it while still maintaining those government. Who's managing the trust who pays these bills on behalf of these people? There are companies that do it. If it's large enough, members trust company, things I work with a lot of them. There's really no bad ones. I would say for the larger trust companies, though, you need, I'd say, a minimum of a million dollars to sort of make it worth their time. Uh, other than that, I would either find a trusted relative who's got some some help, some you know, some knowledge in the financial world. Can even if they don't have knowledge in the financial world, can't hire someone who does. Or you find an attorney like me who does trust administration who can manage it. And then generally, if you get an attorney or a member trust company, they just take an hourly rate for the time that they spend managing the trust. What other type of trust are out there? Discuss sub trust, funeral trust, and children's trust. So the only limit on any kind of trust that you want to create is the legal concept known as void against public policy. If it's something that is so shocking and gross that a court is going to say it and say, we're not going to enforce this provision, then you can do it. Now, funeral trusts are a very special one that is, essentially allows you to right now pay, you pay an upfront fee to a, a funeral company for everything. They'll give you a quote. They'll give you everything that what it would cost today. You pay the money, they then put it into a trust that they're a part of, a large pooled trust, so that they know, and part of the deal with the trust is you die in 20 years, the price on this thing has rocketed by $5,000, they get the full price, they get the full price back. 
covers them, it covers you, so your family isn't somehow scrambling for cash when you pass. Much like trust planning, you get to choose what you want. I've uh, done funeral trusts for people who want an entire police, uh, you know, convoy of off-duty cops on bikes, taking them from the funeral home to their gravesite. Not for me, but it's not my funeral. It is, a, it is a very good way to make sure that the things that you want to happen, happen. They happen quickly. The family isn't scrambling for everything. And what are some of the clauses that they add to trust accounts? Are they like riders and life insurance policies? Somewhat like riders and in, in policies, but again, because you have so much freedom and it's not regulated the way like the insurance industry is, it can it can have anything that you want in it. As long as it's not void by public policy, you can say anything you want. I mean, the, the your imagination is the sky. I want to buy cars for all my kids. I want them to be red cars. I want my child to, if they get above a 3.0 average in college, then they get $25,000 every, you know, every semester. So it's like stipulations. Stipulations is a better way to put it than writers in the clauses. Yeah. What are the different types of investments you can put into a trust account? The only limitation on the investments that you can put into a trust account, especially if you're transferring them to a child upon your death, would be retirement type tax protected account, 401ks, IRAs, things like that. In terms of investing like magic gathering cards, wine, Real estate. There's a lot of real estate investment trusts that you can even invest in, sort of buy into and have a stake in. Anything that you can own, you can transfer into a trust. Speaking of this, and it looks like so, for example, and this is extreme, but I can put the shirt I'm wearing right now in a trust. Absolutely. It's worthless, but I can put it in a trust. Uh, in the case of wine, for example, say I put it into a trust, does that physically have to go somewhere else? Or if I decide to accidentally drink a $5,000 bottle of wine that was in a trust, how does that work? So you transfer a tree, transfer everything as, as a separate legal entity, the way you would transfer anything else without physical, changing physical distance. You can have, you can make literally just a receipt saying, I give this bottle of wine over to the trust. You can list it in the trust document. All trusts have at the, generally at the very end, it's called a schedule A, which lists all of the assets that are in the trust. That isn't legally binding necessarily. Like if something's not on there, it doesn't mean it's not in the trust. That is done more for if you pass someone picks up this trust document and says, I have no idea what this even owns. You can have it there. The court needs some proof that you intended this asset to be held by the trust. And that's a notarized statement, uh, anything like that, the the sure, the better. Now, in terms of if you then drink that bottle of wine, the question there is going to be who manages the trust. It's a trust you set up and you say, I'm settling this and I'm the trustee. I'm the one in charge of it. And it's for my benefit. Then you drink away. If it is for the benefit of 10 different people and there's another person who is the trustee, you've got a couple of problems there. One, you've got other people who have an interest in it. But secondly, you've also got this trustee who is commanded to sort of keep these things safe. That's part of your job as a trustee. If I was the trustee of that, you wouldn't be in a place where you could drink that bottle of wine because it would be in a climate controlled storage room somewhere so that I could know that it was going to be safe until distribution. Perfect. So it does, again, go down to, it depends on the type of trust and where everything's set up. And it sounds like there's enough uh, safety to make sure things like that don't happen. And then what about life insurance? Can you put that in a trust? And is it a good idea? Generally, yes. There's, you know, as with everything else, it depends. My most frequent client, I think, is probably the, the, the person who everybody can benefit from a trust, but the people who tend to have the best time with it, a younger couple with a couple of young kids who own a home and set up a trust or without a trust would have what are called I love you wills. Is if I die, everything goes to my wife. If my wife dies, everything goes to me. With a trust is more, is better protection for if you both die in a car crash and your kids are left, as morbid as that sounds. Then the best deal is to put all of your life insurance assets into the trust. Because what you're going to say in the trust is my wife and I pass, this trust then is set up to take care of my kids. And this, per- this is the person who's going to take care of the trust and make the financial decisions. And so you want every asset you have, life insurance, house, bank accounts, all of it to flow into the trust. Now, that's if both of you pass at the same time. The far more likely scenario is that your wife passes. In that case, you want the life insurance to go directly to you. That's how you're going to use it. So what I tended to tell my clients to do is put a conditional. So if I die in my life insurance, it says it goes to my wife. If my wife is deceased, then it goes to the trust. Also, the insurance would actually go straight to your primary. And then if the primary is not there, then it goes to the trust. So you're avoiding the trust in the beginning. Yes. Makes sense. Okay. And how do you decide who inherits the trust? Is there a process? Do you break it down to your son, your daughter, your siblings? What's the process in deciding, okay, I pass away. How do I know where it goes? 
It's the same as you would in a, in a will if you were executing a will. Who gets what? I want Aunt Doreen to get this pearl necklace that's been in the family for generations. I want my kids to get half of it. I want my sister to get the other half. No different than you would. The only change that you would make, because generally in a will, I give this necklace to Aunt Noreen, and I die 20 years later, and Aunt Noreen has predeceased me. If you're a will, what's going to happen is that Aunt Doreen's kids will then get the, you know, their heirs will take in their place. Under a trust, that doesn't necessarily happen unless you specify it. Because trusts are so flexible, you have to be very specific in what you want to happen. Because if you don't name it, then essentially nothing happens. Unless you, unless you name like a residuary. You, these are the 10 people I want and everything else goes to my favorite child. As a business owner, should you put your business in a trust? If I have a business owner, let's say a single member managed LLC, which is extremely common within Virginia. Unless you somehow put it in an irrevocable trust, which I wouldn't recommend anyways, because you've got the creditor protection with an LLC anyways, put it into the articles of organization. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways to do it, but probably the cleanest way to do it is you put it in the articles of organization. I am, the, I, this is mine. I manage it. I'm the sole member. When I die, my interest goes into this trust here and is then distributed out. Commonwealth of Virginia, a interest in an LLC is property. And so if you don't do anything, if you name nothing, then it passes through your will or through intestacy. If you put it into a trust, it can at least then pass and it can pass quickly and it can pass without probate. And so business operations can continue as quickly as possible, especially if you're also getting like key person insurance or funding in there. The other way that I've seen it done, and I think this actually makes a lot of sense, there is a way to hold property in Virginia called joint tenancy. Joint tenancy, if you set it up right, has something called the right of survivorship. So you and I own a piece of property together and we, we set up a title as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. One of us passes, the other person instantly owns all the property. A probate, it doesn't. And so I have seen it set up where I have a solo managed LLC interest and I, the other person in this is my brother. My brother has no voting rights. He has no right to any distributions of income. He has no ability to do anything in the business, but we own it as joint tenants with rights of survivorship. So that if I pass, he immediately becomes the manager of that LLC and everything proceeds. The only thing that that really gives you, if you set it up correctly, is that you can add that joint tenancy to the all the bank accounts, so that once you pass, this person's already on the already on the bank account can immediately make decisions, can immediately withdraw funds, can payroll if they need to. So, short answer, long way of saying it: a an LLC, an interest in a business is a, just like you would a stock, anything like that. It's an asset that you can transfer into an LLC, but I would do it conditionally. Transferring it into an LLC for, it doesn't offer you too many benefits you don't already have with an LLC. Okay. And with all the different types of investments from comics, wine, art, collectible cars, who manages all this stuff in a trust? If you set it up correctly, it's going to be you, the person that's called a self-settled trust. And so from, from a day-to-day -day perspective, nothing really will change. When you say it like that, from what I understand, you can set yourself up as, I guess, the trustee. And then in a type of trust, you can also not have access to any of that, correct? Because if it's set up as a separate entity, but you still would like someone, probably yourself, to have a good financial understanding and Absolutely. investment. Okay, perfect. Yep. So it's not just for anyone who decides they want to be their trustee and they don't know anything about finances. It's no different from a functional day-to-day -day standpoint than owning the asset yourself. This just gives you a little bit le better legal protection and avoids probate down the line. But then when deciding if you don't want to pick yourself because you don't trust yourself as a financial person, is it better to go to an individual, an organization, obviously different probably fees involved? What are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Think of it like working with a single person financial advisor, single person attorney. I'm a, I'm a solo, I'm a one-man band, as I like to call myself. The advantages of that are every time you pick up the phone, I'm the one who picks up. You're always dealing with me. You're not going to get shuffled off to an associate, which is nice. People like that. They know exactly who they're going to deal with. Now, if you're working with a large law firm, you're probably going to pay a little bit more, but you're going to have an entire team of people there. Somebody gets sick. Somebody goes on vacation. Somebody's going to be there to answer your, your call. They're going to know what's going on and they'll be able to pick up and go forward. You know, I always tell people, if you have over a million dollars in your trust, probably go to a member's trust company. A lot of banks do it. Burke and Herbert Bank, I know that has a very, very large, uh, a sort of trust administration department. Most people do. You know, if you're going to like a Wells Fargo B of A, I wouldn't go with less than 10 million. But if you have a small trust and you want to know the person that's going to be doing it and you want to know that they're going to be the one picking up the phone, I would go to an attorney, trust administration attorney, or someone that you trust. For, for me, it's my brother-in-law is the one that if my wife and I pass, that's a person who manages the trust fund for my kid. I know my brother-in-law. I trust him. He is He doesn't work in the financial sector, but I trust him and I know that he's going to do the right thing. And then going back into what 
can't be put into a trust. You mentioned 401k, RAs, uh, certain, it looks like retirement accounts. Why are they excluded from being put into a trust? I shouldn't say they're excluded from being put into trust. Under the law, when somebody passes, you inherit their 401k, you take it as them. So you have that same tax deferred sign. Now, now you now have the option to liquidate that 401k, but you're going to pay the same tax penalty that this person would have at the same time. Probably what I, you know, Brian, I'm sure if, if this ever happens to you, you tell people just roll it into your existing 401k. Keep it as a 401k, roll it over, keep it as a retirement account. I mean, if I have $100,000 in a 401k, I can put it into a trust, but what's going to happen is the trust is going to break it, and then I'm going to pay $40,000 in, in penalties, and then I'll have that $60,000 that the trust can do whatever they want. There's no advantage to putting uh, those accounts in a trust. No. Okay, what I'm understanding. No, no. No, no advantage. Not to say there's no op, no chance when that may not be your best option, mm-hmm. but there's no advantage. To it. And, uh, you know, you mentioned kind of fees and taxes. What, how are taxes calculated in a trust and who pays them? It's interesting. So it, I always say you, with the standard revocable trust that most people set up, you take it the way, you, generally you take it as income. Depends. If I have a trust and I have a client who's, as you set up a trust, trust now has about half a million dollars into it going to their kids to pay for their education. They're underage right now, and so obviously there's no taxes until they hit 16. But when they're in college, and I'm paying their tuition, and I'm giving them money each month to pay their rent and to buy books and to take girls out and do all that, that will be taxed just like if they had income from a job. Taxed the same way. It is an interesting point, though, that income, taxes or trusts themselves are taxed at a far higher rate in terms of income than a person is. You need to keep that in sight. So a tax, you know, a trust generating income has to file a tax return just like everybody else, except the income coming in from investments and things like that is much higher. Now that's income only. That doesn't mean that's not capital gains. They're still taxed at the same rate for capital gains. If it's just an income generating asset, you own a lot of rental property and the rental property is in there and that's income coming, you know, coming in above your expenses, that's going to be taxed at a much higher rate than it would be. So if you're investing in real estate investment trust, which are known for their dividends, and that's why you invest in those, that's all yield, they're going to be taxed higher on that yield than they would outside in a different account. So close. So it, once you get the dividends and you get the yields, to you, it's just that's just taxed as a capital gain. It's the trust itself that has to do it. That is, the, the income coming into the trust itself and the trust does its own tax return. Okay. So digging into a little bit more of the taxes before we get into a whole tax conversation, sounds like then depends on where you set up, the, which state you set up to trust matter. That's federal tax rate. So you can set up a trust anywhere. Uh, you won't have to worry about state taxes and laws. You don't, much like businesses too, a lot of trusts will try to avail themselves of, it's called a, called a South Dakota trust. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. South Dakota has a, made a niche for themselves in terms of if you have a, a trust that is set up under South Dakota law, which is really just a line, and there has to be a South Dakota attorney who says this trust should be governed by the laws of South Dakota, there's no way for anybody outside of a criminal-like subpoena to figure out who is the beneficiary of the trust, who is the settler of the trust. There's no public way for them to figure it out. The banking laws there for trusts are very lax. The state income tax rate is very, very, very low for tax rate. So yeah, you can, but you can set, well, you can be in Virginia and set up a South Dakota trust. There's no rule that says you have to be located within that state. Kind of like businesses are set up in Delaware. Exactly. So going into this, I was thinking, I have a lot of comic books. I have two children. If something happens to me, obviously I would like to put this in a trust. How can you verify the values of those things? Because when you transfer to the trust, they are taking it as you would. The basis in that comic book would be the same for the trust, would be the same as the basis you took it at. You bought it for $20. And later, the trust sells it for $100. That $80 of is going to be the capital gain. Take it the same way. Correct. But you have to know that I paid the $20 for sure. it. So I guess with art, buy a Rembrandt, and 50 years from now, I put it in a trust. How can you verify what I paid for it? Couldn't I just make up any number at that point? You could if there was no way to prove where you, if you bought it in a private transaction and you, you know there was no auction house. Obviously, a Rembrandt, there's going to be probably some, but if it's just right. an up-and-coming artist that you go into a studio, and 50 years later, he becomes the next big thing, and you sell it generally, no, like any other asset like that, there's no verifiable way other than you lying to the IRS and committing tax fraud, which has an attorney. But I always think about it, because all these conventions I've done, Pokemon cards, Magic the Gathering cards, you don't remember what you pay for these things. And when they do inherit it to my kids, so I don't know how they're valuing these assets 
Do they value it when you set up the trust? Say, okay, what is it worth today? It would be based on when you purchased it, when the grant or the person who put it into the trust purchased it. And from there, you can do a reasonable rate. I'm sure there's, like baseball cards, there's some way to track what uh, a 1955 Mickey Mantle was worth in 1962. In collectible cars, I rebuild a Mustang. How does that value go into a trust? So if I rebuilt a Mustang from a junkyard, it cost me two to $300,000 to rebuild. Obviously, I'm spending more than what the item is worth. I put the Mustang in a trust. It's now worth $80,000. Are they able to write it off as a loss? They are, yeah. Because they take it the same way you held it. Okay. The money you put in there would still be a, to their tax. Would it be best to put a bunch of assets in there that you're losing money on? So that way they're not paying taxes on it? You could. They would have to sell, like if it was a capital gains, they'd have to sell, you know, realize the loss every year to erase any tax liability from any income that they had. But that absolutely can happen. You've heard a lot of terms. I know grantor is the one who issues the trust. Uh, there's a trustee, which I understand is that's the person receiving the trust and the grantor and the trustee can be the same person from what I understand. So it is. So the grantor is the person who sets up the trust, also known as the settler. You're going to hear those, those short terms interchangeably. The trustee is the person who manages the trust. That's the person who oversees the administration. The person who receives the benefit of the trust is the beneficiary. And then a, a trust protector. Trust protector is an interesting thing that is used very infrequently, but like to think of it as an escape valve. A trust protector is someone you nominate in the trust. Their only role is if for some reason, 20 years after it's written, you take it to a court and there's a question about it and the court finds a clause that they find that they think otherwise ruins the trust. That because of this term that we used 20 years ago, because of this, this clause, this trust actually shouldn't operate anymore. This is someone you give the power to step in on a limited basis and erase that part of the trust so that the rest of it doesn't fail. And that person is assigned when the trust is being created? It can be. Generally, it is. You can also say that the trustee can hire you know, an attorney at some point. You have a lot of flexibility in there. When I do it, uh, I tend to, with my client's permission, nominate myself as the trust protector, the person that can go in and correct the error uh, to make sure that the trustees, the, the wishes of the trustee are met. Just thinking about the trust, trustee, trust protector, and the complexities of a trust. We trust have clauses, I guess, when you set up your trust with Wells Fargo, and then five years later, Wells Fargo goes bankrupt. What happens there? You know, assuming that the trust property is still there, that, you know, Wells Fargo went bankrupt, but the, the 500000 you had in this trust is still there and can still be found, you will then petition the court. The beneficiary will then go to the circuit court in the county you're in and say, this is what's going on. We want to have this person be the trustee. That's just logic. That all of that is met and that if all the beneficiaries agree, then they appoint that person the trustee and things proceed as normal. But cryptocurrencies is becoming a more popular thing. The situation with FTX and the collapse and the bankruptcy, if you put your cryptos in FTX, could that be part of a trust? And since they went under, does that mean there's no protections for you or does the trust go after the founders of FTX? You can with FTX, you know, just like you could with the Wells Fargo, the trust can have a bank account. It can have all its cash in the bank account. Same with FTX. You would start the account in the name of the trust, use the trust's, you know, employer identification number instead of the social so that it can be tracked. And then trusts also as legal entities have every right to go and sue on someone's behalf if they want. So the only difference there is when you're, when people are trying to sue Sam Friedman, that the trust is the person that would sue them, not the, not the beneficiary. And have you experienced anyone trying to add cryptocurrencies to trust accounts yet? I have on a limited basis. Most of my clients, if they do involve in crypto, they keep it sort of completely separate. Now they can, just like a bank account. I always tell client, if you have your checking account, have the pay on death beneficiary, just like with life insurance, be your spouse or the trust. And so a lot of people will hold it that same way. Essentially say within the FTX wallet, if I pass, then this is the person who gets it when I die. So with the wallet and the trust account would have the username and password? Correct. Or we at least would have the ability to go to the company and say, hey, this is the person's death certificate. This is trust. This are, you know, I'm the trustee of the trust, so it would give me access to this. Normal company procedure, just like you would if you left it to a person and you passed away. They would submit a you know, certified death certificate to the company. The company would process it and then give you access. We all have credit cards. Is there a way for the trust to protect from creditors coming after you when you die? Yes, you can. I wouldn't recommend it. I always tell people, I always try to put into the trust. If the way my trust is, this is when I die, this trust 
put everything into the trust. The trust then pays the my estate's debts, et cetera. There are ways you can structure it so that you can escape from all that debt, although they're exceedingly hard to do. The courts don't like them. They don't abandon them, but they are. They know, you know, it's one of those things. I, uh, the analogy I always use is my student loans. I went to law school on student loans. I went to college on student loans. I'm swimming in student loan debt. I understand why you can't discharge them in bankruptcy. I would have walked right out of my law school graduation straight to bankruptcy. Nothing. I would have been like, I'll take seven years of bad credit to get erase all this debt. I completely understand why you can't do that. And so there are ways to do it. Uh, they're more and more complicated and they're not guaranteed to work. So I would advise against them. When can you start accessing the trust? So if I'm someone who's inheriting the trust, what are the rules or stipulations that say I have access to this? How do I get access to it? If you're the beneficiary of it, assuming that it's set up correctly, it should be immediate. Uh, just like in Virginia with property, like a stone. I can give you a uh, proof that's, that your kids can give me proof and I'm the trustee of the trust that you have passed away. And the document says, when I pass away, this is what happens. Then your kids get access almost immediately. There's almost, you know, as soon as I can just be reasonably sure that this is true, what they're saying, they get access to the trust. And when can you wind down a trust or why would you wind down a trust? There are times uh, winding down of the trust is done with a, with the court's approval. Uh, and again, that really comes down to if the trustee and the beneficiaries all go to the court and say, we all agree that this should be wound down. And, you know, there's only $15,000 left. Let's just chop it up in half. And the court generally approves. But you have to have agreement with all the parties. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the different uh, benefits of trust, but there's uh, surely some disadvantages. What would you say with the situation, obviously, like you said, not putting retirement accounts in it because it doesn't make much sense. But what are the other disadvantages of a trust for an investor? For an investor, it would be increased complexity. Another set of documents you need to keep. You need to keep uh, somewhere and know where they are. You need to find a, a trustee. You need to some, someone to agree to be the trustee if it's not going to be company. If it is going to be a company, then you know that part of everything that you worked for, part of everything you want to pass on to your kids is going to go into some attorneys or some you know trust company's pocket. If you don't own a home and you have minimal investments and you only have a 401k and a bank account, which is a lot of people and there's nothing wrong with that, but a, a trust is just going to be sort of too complex. It's just going to be to your benefit to name a paying on death POD beneficiaries for all those accounts. And know that when you pass, that's how everything's going to be. I'd like to thank Chris Hanks for speaking with us today. What is the best way for people to reach out to you? Go to my website, hankslaw.org. In the upper right-hand corner, book a consultation. You can put time directly on my calendar to talk. If you have any questions that we did not get to, please list them in the comments section, or you can email us at investorscoffeeshop at gmail.com. You can also contact and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, like, and leave us a review. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We will see you next time at Investors Coffee Shop.